And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles this morning. Turn with me again to Hebrews chapter 11. As we've been going through Hebrews 11 verse by verse. Hebrews 11 again is the chapter known as the chapter of faith or the hall of faith if you want to call it that. Or you could term it this way, chapter 11 is a chapter in which we see from God's perspective what true faith is through the examples of others. And so as I've said before, let me say again, a lot of what we call faith today is not what God calls faith. And so God gives us a clear picture of what he calls faith. And so what we're going to do is look at if God gives us permission this morning, and if God allows the time, we're going to look at one verse this morning, in verse number 7 of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number 7. So if you would please stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. Someone asked me one time, say, why do you have us stand? Because if you read the book of Ezra, it says when they read the book of the law, every man stood for the reading of the law. And by the way, the law is over 660 some statements in the scripture. So they were standing a while, amen? And, uh, but let's read this together. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today for your word and for your truth. Lord, thank you for, Lord, these examples of how you see faith and how you define faith that you've given us here in this chapter. And Father, we know that your word is full of these examples throughout your word. And Father, I thank you by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that, Father, you pulled this collection of examples together for us to be able to study, to be able to learn by. That, Father, we can walk truly by faith and not by sight. And so, Father, would you speak to us through this passage on Noah and through Noah's life, and, Lord, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do and how you do it. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Noah is a, one of our most familiar, if you will, Bible examples throughout Scripture. Um, Noah is probably the name that would capture most people's attention very quickly. And of course, it's something that we've been taught since we were knee-high to a grasshopper was about Noah and the ark and the flood. And so what I want to do is just to try to take this verse... And I want to take each little phrase of this verse and I want to show you how each phrase of this verse was intended to show us what faith is as lived through the life of Noah. Noah was a man in which God saw (coughs) to be transparently different from the rest of the world. Matter of fact, so much so that the Lord tells us in Genesis chapter 6 In verses 8 and 9, it says, And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. By the way, let me just say this real quickly. That is the first time the word grace is used in the canon of Scripture. And what it means is that God showed unmerited favor unto Noah, but at the same time enabled Noah to walk by faith and to obey what he was going to ask him to do. And Noah found faith in the eyes of God. And here's what it says about Noah. Why was this true of Noah? Well, the Bible says these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. Now the word perfect here does not mean he was without sin. The word perfect means that he was mature in his walk with God. He was a man that walked primarily in the righteousness of God. In an obedience to God. And with a desire for God. And walking with God, we know that Noah, as we looked at last week with Enoch, we know that Noah walked in step with God. He walked in unison with God. He walked in the will and ways of God. He did not get ahead of God. He did not get behind God. He just heard from God and obeyed God where God was. And can I tell you, that's what obedience is. Obedience is hearing from the Lord and then walking in the reality of what the Lord says. And by the way, you cannot have faith unless God speaks. 
And so here is what Noah began to walk in. And it says this of Noah, in a day in which he lived, God looked upon Noah and said, this man walked with me. This man was righteous in his walk. Well, what did this bring for Noah? Well, God spoke to Noah. And I want you to see this with me. I want to begin by looking at faith's declaration. Faith's declaration. It has this, by faith Noah, being warned of God. God declared something to Noah. Now you say, well, preacher, what in the world did God warn Noah of? Well, I believe it was two things as we look through Genesis 6 and study through Genesis 6. We know there's two things that God warned Noah of. The first thing was what I would call the evil nature of man. He was conscious of the evil of man. Matter of fact, God would say this about man of that day in verse 5 of chapter 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And so here was Noah. He's now been warned of God. What up? First off, he was made conscious of the evil of man. Now you say, why is that important? Because Noah was never going to understand what God was going to tell him next until Noah first understood what God was going to show him first. And you say, well, preacher, I don't understand that. Well, here's the thing. You're never going to understand the judgment of God if you don't understand the condition of man. And Noah had to understand the condition of man. And God warned Noah about the condition of man. And can I tell you, you'll never understand the condition of man except through the divine holiness of God. It is the holiness of God that awakens us to the condition of man. Now, I want you to hear me. Y'all going to love me? Say amen. amen. If you've never seen yourself the way God's seen you, then you've never understood the provision he made for you. That's the reason salvation comes through what I call Holy Ghost conviction. That's the reason it takes the Holy Spirit of God to awaken us to our need. For what? God has to awaken us to the desperate, desperate state that we are in without God. And only then and only then can a man come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So God has to make you conscious of your evil, conscious of your Adam nature, conscious of your self-centered nature before God can ever awaken your heart to his provision. And so God made Noah conscious of the evil of man. But there was a second thing in which God may warn Noah of. Not just the evil of man, but he made Noah conscious of the end of man. The end of man. Can you imagine Noah, this man that was walking up on this earth? If you will, he was a rose among thorns in the world in which he was living. And here was Noah just walking and trusting God step by step. And God declares unto Noah and warns Noah that, Noah, there's coming a moment in time in which I am going to draw this life to an end. He's going to remove, if you will, every living animal and every living soul from this earth. And can you imagine what was going through Noah's eyes? Can you imagine what this would have meant for Noah if Noah wasn't conscious of the evil of man? Can you imagine what would have been going through Noah's mind if Noah had no understanding of why God had to do this? Not that God wanted to do this, but God had to do this. Why? Because God is holy and God is just and man will never understand his provision unless they see him in his holiness. And because he's holy, he could not let what was taking place to continue. And so God warned Noah. And Noah received that warning by faith. By faith, Noah being warned of God. And so Noah, by faith, accepted what God said. Not only about man in, their, in, his, in the evil nature of man, but about man in the end of man. And there for the first time, God told Noah, I'm going to destroy man from the face of the earth. Man in which God created man in which God intended to have fellowship with, man in which God intended and longed to redeem and restore, but man in which God knew would never turn to him. And God told Noah, I'm drawing the curtain to a close. Now you say, well, preacher, I don't understand. What has all that got to do with us? That's Noah. That's not us. 
Oh, can I tell you today that right now the Holy Spirit of God is going around this world making man conscious of their evil nature. And can I tell you, God also through his word is trying to make man conscious that there's coming an hour, there's coming a day when the curtain will draw closed and man that has heard the gospel will never have an opportunity to be saved again. And can I tell you, God's not going to put up with what's going on in our world much longer. Now you say, preacher, when's this going to happen? I don't have a clue when it's going to happen. But I just know this, God is holy. And if God allowed what's going on in this world to continue for an infinite time period, God would cease to be holy as he is. And I promise you, he is holy and he will always be holy. And one day he's going to draw this to a close. You need to be conscious that that day's coming. And you need to be conscious that that day could take place at any moment, at any time, in any hour of this day. Y'all with me? Say amen. Amen. You need to live on the reality that any moment God could do for you and I what he did for Noah. He could pull him out of judgment and he could pour judgment upon this world at any time. So we see face declaration. But I want you to see secondly face revelation. Because here's what it says. By faith Noah being warned of God. Of what? Of things not seen yet. Now, you you say, wait a minute, what's the difference between face declaration and face revelation? Because not only did God show Noah about the evil of man and the end of man, but God showed Noah exactly how he was going to do it. I mean, he was showing Noah of things that man had never seen before and Noah had never seen before. You say, what was he going to show Noah? Well, he showed Noah that there's coming a day that water would fall from the sky called rain. Never happened before. Genesis chapter 2 tells us that God watered the earth from below. But here, it was not going to just come from below. It was going to come from above. Listen, it would have been very easy for Noah to say, God, wait a minute. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't believe what I don't understand. Sound like me and you? But can I tell you, that's the reason it's faith. That's the reason it's not by sight. And listen, that's the reason it took faith for Noah to surrender to what God said. And you say, well, how do you know he believed it? I promise you, he wouldn't have built a boat if he didn't think it was going to happen. And so Noah just trusted the revelation of God. Now again, I say this again, and I'm going to say it over and over. Look where Noah's faith began. It began with the declaration and revelation of God's word. And so here is Noah, and he now has a declaration from God. He has a revelation from God. And listen, this revelation that God gives him, that what is going to take place, what he has never seen before is going to happen, was something that Noah would not just have to receive at that moment in time, but Noah would have to receive for a year upon year upon year. Let me be specific. It took him 120 years to build that ark. And for 120 years, Noah would have to trust that what God said was true. Even though he saw no tangible evidence of it ever occurring. And not only that, but Noah would proclaim what God said was going to take place. See, faith believes God even though you see no evidence of it. And so here is Noah. He is is conscious of the fact of what God's going to do. And he's conscious of the way in which God's going to do it. So he's conscious of the will of God. And he's conscious of the ways of God. Now, I'm going to make this statement, and I want you all to hear me very clearly. Y'all with me? Say amen. A lot of people know the will of God. But here's where we get in trouble. It's not knowing the will of God that gets us in trouble. If you have the brain the size of a BB, you can read the Bible and know the will of God. Amen? But here's the question. If we know the will of God, are we accomplishing his will, God's ways? Because here's what we do, folks. We know the will of God, and then we get our minds together and we decide, all right, now here's how we're going to accomplish the will of God. Y'all say amen. Amen. And so what we do is we try to figure out how we're going to do God's will. 
Here's the amazing thing about Noah. God warned Noah, and God gave Noah things that were not seen, and God gave Noah every little measurement, the type of wood, the measurement of the ark, how it's to be constructed, and there was not one minor detail in which God left out of how Noah was to build that ark. Now, it would have been easier for Noah to say, listen, this this wood's too hard to find. Let's go over here and get this wood. Oh, or this dimension, this, this, listen, this is, this is too big of a door. I can't close this door. Let's make it smaller that we can handle it as a family. Y'all got this? Amen. I mean, God gave Noah divine revelation. And revelation of every single aspect of what was to be done and how it was going to be done. So God not only communicated his will, things not seen. He communicated his ways. And I want you to listen. You may know the will of God and walk in unbelief. But if you know the will of God and the ways of God, you can't help but walk by faith. Y'all with me? Say amen. amen. So here we go. So face revelation. Well, what did this declaration and revelation cause in Noah's heart? Well, notice what it says. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen, moved with what? Fear. Isn't that a good, good picture? And this is what I call faith motivation. Because here's the thing. When God speaks, there's something within us if we walk by faith that rises up within us and says, yes, yes, yes. When faith speaks, our spirit acts. And so now what we see is Noah was a man that when he heard from God and when he was given the details of God of what God was going to do, now conscious of man's nature and conscious of man's ending, now Noah moved, immediately stepped out on faith, moved in fear. Now, you understand the word fear means awe or reverence of, but I want you to listen. True fear, the Bible says, is the beginning of all wisdom. And if you do not have the fear of God, you do not have wisdom in God. And so you and I must understand, if you don't have an awe of who he is, and you don't reverence who he is moment by moment, day by day, if you don't walk in a pathway of life that every step you take is conscious that God, a holy God who saved me and redeemed me, is the one that lives through me and is present with me, you'll never walk in the wisdom of God. Because fear is the beginning of wisdom. Now I want you to listen to a verse that I think fits so with this passage in Noah's faith but also is a verse for you and I. Isaiah chapter 66 verses 1 through 2. Here's what it says. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, God speaking here, and the earth is my footstool. How many agree today we need to get a good understanding of who God is and who we are? I hear people all the time, they say, all right, I'm going to tell God this is what he needs to do. I got news for you, folks. Y'all love me, say amen. You're never going to tell God what he needs to do. He's going to tell you what he's going to do, and then you can trust him that he'll do what he said he'll do. But I hear these people ordering God around. I want to tell you something, folks. You can't order God around. Heaven is his throne, and the earth is his footstool. Now, watch what it says here. Watch what it says in Isaiah 66. It says, where is the house that you build to me? Where is the place of my rest? For all these things have my hand made, and all these things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. And listen to this, and trembleth at his word. Trembleth at his word. God said, who am I going to look to? Who am I going to give wisdom to? Who am I going to give understanding to? Who am I going to enable to walk in my will and my ways? But him that is of a poor and contrite spirit who trembleth at my word. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all promise y'all getting this? When's the last time the word of God made you shudder? When's the last time you opened the book of God and reading the book of God, you just got broken by what you were reading because of the awe of what he said to you? Can I tell you, folks, 
I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to preach to myself a minute. My prayer for my life is for every moment of every day for me to tremble and shudder and absolutely be conscious of everything God wants to say to me. I want to be broken before him. But I also want to be conscious of him. That if I'm broken before him and conscious of him, I can rejoice in him. Y'all with me? The Bible says, happy is he who is of a broken spirit, poor spirit. Happy is he who is meek. You see, folks, we think of happiness as being able to live our lives like we want to live it. Oh, listen. Happiness is walking in the holiness of who God is. And Noah trembled at the word. Why? God spoke, Noah moved, and Noah moved in awe and fear of God. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, let me put it to you this way. Noah moved conscious that if he didn't obey God, what God said about man could have been true about him. Y'all got that? Say amen. Noah, Noah moved in fear. By faith, Noah moved with fear. So we see faith's motivation. I want you to see, fourthly, faith's determination. It says here that Noah moved with fear, prepared an ark. Prepared an ark. Now, here, here's the picture. I, I want you to see this. Genesis 6, Listen to what it says of Noah and his obedience. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah's faith was a working faith. What does it say? Exactly what God said Noah did. How much did he do of what God said? The Bible says he did all that God commanded him. I, I like how we do this. We, we love reading the word of God and then picking and choosing. Y'all love me say amen. I mean, we think the word of God's a buffet table it runs. I don't like broccoli. And I don't like fried pickles. <laughs> That's an inside joke with me and somebody in here. But anyway, so when I go to Ryan's, I don't eat the broccoli because I don't like it. Y'all say amen. amen. Y'all with me? And so many times when we go to the Word of God, that's the way we go to the Word of God. We go to the Word of God. Boy, I like that. I'm going to obey that. Yeah, that's for Donald. <laughs> You with me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, love your enemy. Hmm. Well, our preacher will cover that one. Y'all got it? See, that's not faith. That's unbelief. Can I tell you, you can obey most of what God says and disobey a part of what God says and you're walking in unbelief and not faith. I ask people all the time, do you believe the Bible? And of course, everybody says, yes, preacher, we believe the Bible. But can I tell you, how much of the Bible you believe is how much you're living in. Y'all love me? <laughs> Amen? I mean, I, listen, I'm preaching to myself here. It, this is me too. I mean, we need to understand how God sees faith. He obeyed all that God said for him to do. And so what did faith do? Faith began to be that revelation for Noah's heart that motivated him in awe and fear of God and consciousness of God. And then Mo Noah acted upon what God said and did what God said to do and prepared an ark. Just as God said to do it. See, faith without works is dead. James chapter 2. In other words, let me put it to you this way. Here's Tester's commentary on that verse. Faith that does not work never worked to start with. Faith produces activity. Faith produces response. Faith produces obedience. Faith produces that in our life in which we will consciously and willingly walk in the will and ways of God. And if it's never worked, it's never worked from the start. 
It was never saving faith to begin with. Now, here's, here's the next thing. I want you to see this. Faith's determination led to faith's salvation. You say, is there a fruit for obedience? Is there a fruit for walking in faith? Oh, yes. Listen to what it says here in verse 7. It says, and, and Noah by faith prepared an ark to the saving of his what? His house. So guess what? Aren't you glad that when that 120 years was over and Noah was finished with that ark and it started watering coming from the bottom and water coming from the top in the form of rain which he had never seen before, aren't you glad Noah obeyed God? To the saving of his own house. Now, I want you to listen. The ark is a beautiful picture of the person of the Lord Jesus. You say, how do you know that? Because Peter tells us that in, in his writing. But here's the thing. In, in the picture of the Lord Jesus, there are several things, and I'm just going to go through a couple real quickly to kind of let you get the picture of what this verse is saying. Because the ark was constructed in such a way, if, you, if you'll study out the dimensions that was given to Noah in the book of Genesis, you find out it was, it was designed in such a way that if you look at it, how many of y'all were here for the creation conference? How many of you got to see the replica of that ark? What did it remind you of? A coffin. Did it not? It reminds you of a coffin. Why is that? Well, I don't believe there's anything by accident. Y'all say amen. Number one, I believe God knew exactly how to design an ark that did stay float, number one. But number two, I believe that God knew that everything he did was going to be a picture of what he was going to do. And can I tell you, you cannot enter into life unless you first enter into death. Life out of death. Unless a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus said, unless you lose your life, you cannot gain life eternal. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. And so the design of the ark pictures the entrance into salvation. But here's the other thing. Here's what God told Noah in chapter 6. He said, I want you to take pitch and I want you to spread it on the inside, and I want you to spread it on the outside. And you say, what is pitch? Well, it was just this gummy, sticky, tarry substance that they had in that day. Would be equivalent to what we would call tar today. And here's what God said to Noah. He said, I want you to take this tar-like substance. I want you to spread it all in the inside. I want you to spread it all in the outside. I want you to cover the inside, and I want you to cover the outside. And you say, well, preacher, how in the world is that a picture of salvation? Because the word pitch in the Old Testament Hebrew is the word we get translated over a hundred times as the word of atonement, which means to cover our sin. And what it meant simply was this, that as Noah built this ark out of that gopher wood, which, by the way, is the hardest form of wood that they had of that day, speaks of the incorruptibility of Christ, that he never changes, that he never will diminish, and he'll never forsake or forsake us. And listen, at the same time, there was no way any of the water of judgment could get inside that ark. Why? Because it was covered. It was covered. Y'all got that? Say Amen. Listen, folks, when God saved us, he shed his own blood that you and I could be redeemed from the judgment and from our own self, and we could be redeemed and atoned for, and judgment will never touch a child of God. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Folks, I'm telling you. There's one other thing. Genesis chapter 7 verse 1 says this, And God spoke to Noah, and he said, come into the ark, you and your family. He didn't say, go into the ark, Noah, you and your family. He said, come into the ark, you and your family. You say, well, preacher, what does that have to do with? Listen, if God was on the outside, he would tell Noah to go. If he was on the inside, he'd say, come. Can I tell you today, when God convicted you by the Holy Spirit, it was him saying, I'm ready to receive you unto myself, and I'm ready to be that for you that you could never be for yourself, but you must open your heart and come. And here's the great thing. When Noah and his family were in the ark, they were in God's provision. All that were outside the ark were outside God's provision. When you and I came through grace, through faith, and God redeemed us and saved us because he was wooing and drawing us unto himself, we came into his family by new birth. 
But oh, greater than that. He came in us by life and the Holy Spirit. And now we became the tabernacle of Him in a world that desperately needed to see Him. My, what a God we see. By faith, Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his own house. Isn't that amazing? Oh, but listen, that's not all. It also says in this verse that not only to the saving of his own house, but by which he condemned the world. Face manifestation. What takes place when God, when we walk by faith in the will and the ways of God? What takes place when we're obedient to God and we become vessels which God can demonstrate His power and His might and His character and His nature? Our walk and our witness condemns the world. And you say, well, wait a minute, preacher. I thought our walk and our witness was to evangelize the world. Y'all do like this. You say, how can it condemn the world and evangelize the world? Because the world will never be evangelized till they realize they've been condemned. Why would you ever want the cure if you don't know the problem? <coughs> See, our walk of faith and our lives ought to be an open Bible to this world. And can I tell you what this Bible says to this world? You're lost. You're ungodly. You're an alien. You're an enemy against me as God. But I gave my son for God so loved the world that I gave my only begotten son. Isn't that what God said to us? And can I tell you? What makes John 3, 16 so glorious is knowing who we are without him. And so Noah's witness and Noah's walk condemned the world because faith manifested itself in his obedience. You know, I said this last week, and I'm not going to say it again, but can you imagine what was going on during that 120 years when Noah was building an ark and telling everybody that rain was going to come and flood the earth? <laughs> I, I mean, them folks may thought Noah would fall off his rocker. But can I tell you, faith does not make sense to anybody but you and the one you're obeying. Y'all got that? And so Noah obeyed God. Now, here's the thing. His walk was in righteousness. We know that from what we looked at earlier. But his witness was more than just what they saw. It's what they heard. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, And God spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing flood upon the world of the ungodly. A preacher of righteousness. And so Noah not only walked in such a way, but it's, it's like, I mean, I can imagine, Noah, what are you doing? Well, I'm just obeying God. God told me he's going to destroy the world by flood. He told me to build this ark. How's that going to happen, Noah? Oh, it's going to rain. What's rain? I don't know, but God said it's going to happen. I've never seen it before, but I believe him. And you better believe him too. Can you imagine? And for 120 years, he preached righteousness. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying God warned Noah, and Noah warned the people. Y'all didn't get that. If you know what's coming, and you truly know what's coming, you'll have no problem warning people of what's coming. You say, well, preacher, that's your job. <laughs> eh, wrong answer. <laughs> that's our call. Our call. Here's the last thing. I want you to see this, and I'm done. Face imputation. What do you mean? It says, and, because, and, beca and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Romans chapter 4 says of Abraham that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Would you all agree that was true of Noah? Say amen. 
but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he is able also to perform. How many of you agree that's true of what Noah did as well? And therefore, 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 what is there therefore? Because the faith of Abraham and the faith of Noah brought forth something in reality in their life. What is it? Therefore, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So how was Noah reconciled to God? By faith. How was Abraham reconciled to God? By faith. They just chose to believe God and what God said. Not works. Listen, it wasn't Noah building the ark that reconciled him to God. It was Noah hearing from God and obeying God by faith, trusting what God said. And the faith is what produced the activity. The activity didn't produce the faith. The faith produced the activity. Y'all got that? And so you say, well, preacher, can you tally tie all this together for us to help us in this day? Yes, I can. Matthew's gospel says it this way. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Just as people were deceived in the days of Noah, people would be deceived in the day in which Jesus comes. Just as people were walking in the attitude and a heart that was contrary to God in the days of Noah, people were walking in an attitude of heart that's contrary to God when Jesus comes again. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now let me ask you a question. If you look at our world today, do you see similarities between the days of Noah? Y'all ain't getting this, are you? You better look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Father, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you. Thank you for your warning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you. For your glorious return. Father may we be men and women. That are found faithful. When you come. Father may we be men and women. That you can say of us. What you said of Noah. That we just trusted you. The provision you made for us. Through your son. The Lord Jesus Christ. And we abandon ourselves. To who we are. And we abandon ourselves to who you are. We died to who we are. That we could live in who you are. Father, you're always speaking. But Father, I must ask myself, am I always hearing? Father, am I conscious of your presence? To the point that whenever you speak, I'm attentive. I'm listening. Oh God. Even the saying of those words convicts my heart. Because Father, truth be known, I've not arrived yet. You're still working on me. Father, I pray that I'd be so conscious of your presence that my heart and my life could be summed up with these words. I heard and I obeyed. If that's all that's ever said about me or any of us in this place, Father, that's all that would ever need to be said. That we heard and we obeyed. Oh, Father, I don't know who you're speaking to this morning. Father, maybe there's 
individuals in this place that know that the curtain's drawing nigh. And maybe this morning you made them conscious of their need, their need for you. Father, your door of grace is open. Father, if you're convicting their heart, if you're pricking their heart, Lord, you're saying, come, come. I've got a covering for you. It's the blood of my son. Come, come. So, Father, whatever you need to do in this invitation, would you do it for your honor and for your glory? And we'll thank you in Jesus' name.